As I already said, food chains and food webs are generally depicted as a hierarchy. So primary producers at the bottom and, lar and other secondary, tertiary, fourth level, fifth level, on up, and each one of those are called trophic levels. It really refers to the predominant mode of nutrition of an organism. We talk about autotrophs. We've seen this word before, automatically feeding. So those organisms that photosynthesize or chemosynthesize, we don't want to forget about them, they occupy the first trophic level, the bottom of the food chain, the so-called bottom of the food chain. We already talked about organisms that feed on the autotrophs, the herbivores, they're the primary consumers. They occupy the second trophic level. First level carnivores occupy the third trophic level. And I know this gets a little bit ridiculous in talking about first and third and all that different kinds of things. But as long as you keep track of really who's eating whom and what role they play, I think you'll be able to keep it straight. When we arrange organisms in terms of their numbers, or how many, they, how much they weigh, essentially their biomass, or their energy content, we can convert a food chain or even a food web into what's called a trophic pyramid. And it's this analysis, this putting organisms according to numbers, biomass, or energy into a trophic pyramid that really helps us understand how energy and matter are transferred up food chains or up food webs and really helps us understand the, the importance, really in some ways, of eating lower on the food web or lower on the food chain and why that is a good strategy and why whales, particularly the largest organism on earth, the blue whale uh, and other large organisms, try to feed lower on the food web and we'll see why that makes sense in terms of the trophic pyramid in just a second. Well, here's what a trophic pyramid looks like for the ocean. This would be a three-level trophic pyramid. Here we have the phytoplankton at the base of the food web. Here we have krill in the second level. And here we have a baleen whale, a whale that feeds on plankton and krill as the top predator. And in this particular trophic pyramid, we've simply taken either the numbers or the biomass or even the energy content and depicted it as a wedge that's part of a pyramid. This is where the idea of a trophic pyramid comes from. And it's been around for quite a while, and it's a very successful way, again, of depicting how energy or matter and or matter are moved or part of the uh, typical food web. Now, one thing you'll note about this trophic pyramid is that literally the base of the food web is the largest amount. So phytoplankton, obviously, numerically, as well as in terms of biomass and energy content, there's more of them than anything. And we'll see why that has to be true in just a few moments as well. Well, it all comes down to something called trophic efficiency. The transfer of energy and matter from one trophic level to the next is never 100% efficient. And here's a good way to think about it. When you eat, particularly if you eat something like potato chips, but when you eat most anything, except for all the but most careful eaters, some of that food may drop off your fork or spill out of your mouth. I'm reminded of a Carl's Jr. commercial, which I personally think is kind of gross, but in any case, it serves for my example here. Some food doesn't make it into your mouth. Even that food that does make it into your mouth it's not always completely digested. Um, some of that food eventually comes out of you in different ways. And so the energy and the matter that's part of the food that we take into our bodies, there's not a 100% assimilation efficiency. You're not assimilating all of that energy and all of that matter. Otherwise, we'd have no need for our excretory systems. And some people might think that could be a good thing. But in any case, it all relates to trophic efficiency. When organisms eat phytoplankton, for example, not all of that energy in the phytoplankton, not all of that chemistry, not all of the matter in the phytoplankton is made part of that second level. There's an efficiency with which energy and matter are transferred from one trophic level to the next trophic level. And that efficiency is called the trophic efficiency. So formally, 
the amount of energy and matter that's actually transferred from one trophic level to the next defines what's called the trophic efficiency. And it really represents how much energy and matter is going to make it from one trophic level to the next. And if you're thinking ahead a little bit, because it's not 100% efficient, that puts limits on the higher trophic levels. That means that to get to a higher trophic level, you have to have a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of matter just to produce the small numbers of very high trophic levels. And in an intuitive kind of way, I hope you understand that because it really relates as well to how we can support top predators and how valuable they are essentially in terms of the energy that they do contain because it took a lot of phytoplankton, a lot of zooplankton, a lot of planktivorous fish to make that one tuna. And when we consume that tuna and don't really pay attention to all that goes into making it, just like any kind of food, if we don't pay attention to the energy it takes to make it, then we're sort of short, uh, short sighting, being short sighted about the importance and the value of that food. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a few minutes. If we look at a, again, a three level trophic pyramid, and this one happens to be in terms of calories, so it's an energy trophic pyramid, we might see something that looks like this. We might have 10 million calories of phytoplankton and a million calories of copepods and 100,000 calories of fish. Quick now, can you calculate the trophic efficiency? How much energy is being transferred from phytoplankton to the zooplankton? How much energy is being transferred from the zooplankton to the fish? Can you figure that out? Well, it's not too difficult. If 10,000, excuse me, 10 million calories are available in phytoplankton, but only a million make it, one million is one-tenth of 10 million, and thus the trophic efficiency is simply 10%, one over 10. By the same token, if we have a million calories of copepods, and that million calories of copepods is required to make 100,000 calories of fish, we again, 100,000 is one-tenth or 10% of a million, and so the trophic efficiency here is 10%. So in this example shown, we've shown that the trophic efficiency of transfer of energy and matter, at least in this case energy, from one trophic level to the next, is about 10%. And you might be surprised to learn that that's about the average trophic efficiency in many ecosystems, in many food webs. That only 10% of the energy, or 10% of, of one food level, one trophic level, makes it up to the next trophic level. 90% is removed each time we transfer food and energy up to the next higher trophic level. Think about that.